Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good evening or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. We're pleased to bring you the final installment of the 2020 E4C seminar series. This series aims to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. We host a new research institution monthly to learn about a new research uh, webinar monthly to learn about their work advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Today's webinar is presented by Dr. Tanya Rosenquist and Dr. Nick Brown. My name is Mariela Machado and I'm program manager at E4C. I'll be one of your moderators for today's webinar alongside with Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman. Welcome. This series was launched by Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman who leads ASME's Engineering Global Development Research Committee. And um, uh, uh, Jesse has been a close collaborator of or E4C for a long time. He's the Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Michigan. He earned his PhD in Mechanical Engineering in 2014 from MIT. He also holds an SM in Mechanical Engineering and a Bachelor's in Ocean Engineering from MIT. He currently is the director of the Global Design Laboratory. The group focuses on developing design processes and support tools to help multidisciplinary design teams think at a system level when performing complex system design tasks. This includes investigating the best way to incorporate system level interactions between stakeholders in emerging markets into the design decision making process. This seminar you're participating in today will be archived on our E4C site and our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming webinars is available on the E4C site. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org as you're seeing on the slide. We also invite you to share your feedback at the end of the seminar series to inform our strategy, especially for 2021. Uh, so we really encourage you to be active participators. And we'll share this um, form uh, in, um, right after when, the, when Nick and Tanya start uh, the webinar. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with the hashtag E4C seminar series. Before we move on to our presenters, I would like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and a global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and so social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of these challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, among many others. We really invite you to become a member. The membership is free and it has access to news and thought leadership insights uh, of hundreds of essential technologies through the solutions library, professional development resources, and also current opportunities for jobs, fellowships, uh, funding calls, etc. So we invite you to become a member and, and receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events. We invite you to visit our site, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. This slide that you're seeing here on the screen is one of the, of the um, resources that you will have access to uh, if you visit our web website. E4C's research work, work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by the E4C fellows annually on behalf of our partners and sponsors and, the liberal, and delivered as digestible reports and, uh, that have implementation insights. We really invite you to visit our website and we'll be sharing that link uh, in a couple of minutes in the chat. This uh, research that you're seeing right here, um, if, you go to, if we go to the previous slide, uh, Marilyn, please. Um, this research that you're seeing on the, screen, on the screen is a state of engineering for global development and compilation of the academic programs and institutions offering training in this sector. So, fa so far as you're seeing on the screen, we have North America, Australia, and New Zealand super relevant for the, the webinar that you're about, about to listen to in this seminar. And we also have Asia that we have just published and Latin America. 
if you're interested in this sector and if you're interested in, in, in getting involved, uh, be sure to check this, um, these resources out on the link on the screen and the link that we'll be sharing in the chat shortly. Now we'd like to uh, get a moment to meet our audience. Uh, please use the chat window and just uh, type. And I know you all are now very comfortable with Zoom, most of the people that are here listening to us, uh, but we just wanna uh, get to know you a little more and, and, and use uh, the functions. So you see in the chat window below, if you wanna type where you're joining us from, your location. Please feel free to do that right now. And um, if the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. Welcome from Ann, Ann Arbor in Michigan, Atlanta, Iowa, Venezuela, welcome. Australia, Perth, um, Munich, um, Bristol, UK, Illinois, and other from Brisbane, Australia. So we have people from all over South Carolina, Welcome, Adelaide in Australia. Welcome, everyone. We're thrilled to have you. Um, and we're very excited for you being a part of this webinar from all over the world. A couple of additional instructions before we get started. You can use the chat window, the one that you just used to share remarks during the session. Um, and if you have technical questions or technical difficulties, just send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. Um, if you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start or reconnect once more. And you might uh, or just trying to open the Zoom with a different browser. Um, during the, the, the seminar, please use the Q&A window because we will allocate 15 minutes of this, uh, of this session to Q&A. So be sure to type your questions to the presenter. Uh, click the, the Q&A icon. If you cannot see it at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides, we'll gather these questions and ask the presenters at the end of the webinar. And so be sure to send us your questions in advance. So without further to say, and I have taken too much time now, I just want to introduce our incredible presenters for today, Dr. Tanya Rosenquist and Dr. Brown. Uh, do, both of, uh, of these um, great speakers are lecturers in humanitarian engineering at our MIT University in Melbourne, Australia, and co-leads of the R R MIT's humanitarian engineering lab. Uh, I will first introduce Tanya. Uh, Dr. Tanya uh, graduated, uh, has a master's in, in engineering design and innovation from the Technical University of Denmark and her PhD from the University of Technology, Sydney. She, has, she leads a highly transdisciplinary research that explores the relationship between people and technology and draws on participatory design, co-design and human-centered design. Tanya has conducted a qualitative uh, research in low-income communities in the Asia-Pacific region on topics related to the unsustainability of community and household-based water and sanitation services. Tanya is the co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Humanitarian Engineering. Welcome, Tanya. Uh, we also have Dr. Nick Brown that uh, graduated with a Master's of Engineering Civil and Environmental Engineering and a PhD from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Dr. Nick uh, research work focuses on the application of design, technology, and education for social, social change. Nick is the domain leader of the humanitarian engineering community of practice, focusing on de defining competencies on education practices for humanitarian engineering, which is what they're speaking, what we're here to hear uh, today about. So without further to say, I just want to welcome and, and, and say thank you for joining us today to Dr. Nick Brown and Dr. Tanya Rosenquist. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you. Just popping on some slides. Hopefully those should be visible now. Yes, they are. Great. Wonderful. Nick, over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to be here. And thank you for that fantastic introduction. Um, it's amazing to see the number of people that have joined us from around the world, um, especially to those people uh, in Perth, because that means you're getting up very early this morning. So thank you for joining us. And I know that there are some people, I think, in the in the east coast of the US and even the further, further east. So thank you for staying up uh, late at night. Uh, the marvels of uh, the modern uh, internet and world. Um, but yes, today, uh, myself and uh, Tanya uh, will take 
um, hopefully about half an hour to talk a little bit about uh, teaching humanitarian engineering and providing uh, a, an Australian perspective uh, on that. Um, and then hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions. Uh, we're also going to be pre presenting some of our concepts around how we teach, um, some of the frameworks and so on. And we'd also love to actually receive some feedback on that and, and get some uh, additional perspectives. Um, so um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we plan to do today. But I'm going to start um, by talking about um, uh, to just to indicate that Australia's first peoples are actually the oldest continuous living culture on Earth. Uh, Western science traces the culture to be at least 60,000 years old, but I've met plenty of Aboriginal people who tell me nah, it's much longer than that. Um, there's actually no treaty currently between non-Indigenous and Aboriginal people in Victoria, which is the state where me and uh, Tanya uh, live and work. Um, and, there, and the land that we occupy is actually unceded. That means that myself and Tanya are essentially uninvited guests in someone else's home. And whilst we're here on Aboriginal land, we acknowledge the traditional owners and commit to preserving the land, waterways and wildlife of the country we are on. Aboriginal Australians were actually the world's first engineers. There are countless examples of engineering creative problem solving around Victoria and around Australia. The Bujbim cultural landscape itself is located on the traditional country of the Gunjajamara people. Um, it was a set of uh, waterways, um, a system of waterways and channels uh, that have been maintained for over 6,000 years. It was used to funnel and uh, drive uh, uh, fish and eel stocks um, and, and, and maintained the sustainability of that to make sure that there was food every single season. Um, that site, the Budrum Cultural Landscape, was recently recognised with World Heritage Listing um, by UNESCO. Um, and I think that if we respond to the offer of uh, knowledge by the Gundujimara people, then we might ask ourselves as engineers, how might we consider the design life cycle of the next product or system that we develop to be 6,000 years, or maybe even 600? I think that in our current engineering thinking, too much of our stuff is on this very short term basis. Uh, what an amazing kind of uh, drive and, and pressure to try and think about, okay, how could we make it longer? Um, and so it's really important to understand that we work and teach on country all the time. And this is really important for engineering uh, to have a genuine commitment to reconciliation which is much needed. Um, you may have seen it making international news was the recent destruction of cultural sites by engineering companies at Junkan Gorge. Um, and also there's been recent removal of the Jurabwurrung birthing trees along a highway expansion very close to Melbourne. It reminds us that all engineering project work takes place on country and we should be respectful of that. Um, it's another reminder that engineering is more than just the technical and that we need to be conscious and reflect culture, society and people. Um, we ask you to consider whose country you're on. How was that land obtained? And if it was questionably obtained, are the indigenous population marginalized? And what are you doing for reconciliation? That starts with knowing whose country you're on and acknowledging the traditional custodians of that country. So I'd like to start today by acknowledging the people of the Wurrung and Boorong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of RMIT University. We also respectfully acknowledge the ancestors and elders past, present and emerging, as well as acknowledging the traditional custodians and the ancestors of the land and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. If we look a little more recent history than 60,000 years ago, we come on to thinking about uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's right, we're going for the big one. I'm sure I don't need to go into this in too much detail, but over 70 years ago, 1948, we have this set of human rights. Everyone has the right here to these essential services. Um, we've included Article 26 here as well, because of course there's the engineering, it's the education uh, provision as well. But yet over 70 years later, there's still billions of people without access to these essential services. More recently, the need to provide these essential services in a timely manner has been summarized in the Global Goals for Sustainable Development, of course, Engineering for Change uh, being a, a key driver of some of their work. And we know that engineering has always had a role to play in national development and providing benefit, benefits to societies. We think that we, from our work, we start to see in the 1960s, the engineering profession starting to engage in more longer term humanitarian and development work. 
But now, of course, there are loads of engineering organizations and groups working towards sustainable futures in development contexts, including organizations, of course, like Engineering for Change, Engineers Against Poverty, Engineering with World Health, um, Engineers Without Borders, and, and so on and so on. There are also a number of for-profit engineering companies that are starting to uh, do more work in this space. Uh, GHD and, and Arup are two organizations that I know based in Australia have do a lot of work in the development space for profit. Uh, Tetra Tech is a, is a huge one. Uh, now Coffee, I think, is a part of the same group. Um, but, but this leads into this concept of engineering uh, in a development space, uh, working with marginalized communities, which brings us on to our definition or our understanding of humanitarian engineering, this thing that we call humanitarian engineering in Australia. So for us, humanitarian engineering is taken as the application of an engineering discipline, such as you know, civil, mechanical, aerospace, whatever, to a specific humanitarian or development context or response. In this way, we consider it as more of an application area, but requiring additional dedicated knowledge, skills, attributes, competencies, rather than necessarily a unique discipline by itself. We're aware that this is a slightly broader understanding than in other countries. Uh, for example, we understand that in the US, humanitarian engineering encapsulates predominantly non-US development, whilst in the UK, humanitarian engineering tends to be related to disaster response and, and recovery. I really like here the vision to, to, uh, to summarize with the vision that EWB Australia proposes, which is, Imagine a world where everyone has access to the engineering knowledge and resources required to live a life of opportunity free from poverty. For me, that really summarizes the goal and the vision of humanitarian engineering. Specifically in Australia, we consider three contexts for humanitarian engineering application. The first is disaster response. So imagine that there was the Gorka earthquake in Nepal and um, you know, uh, engineers were some of the first people from Australia through the organization Redar, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, to get on the ground. We needed, uh, we needed water engineers to um, get water systems back up and running. We need telecommunications engineers to um, get the communication systems back on so we could actually talk to each other and, and the, resp the disaster response could be coordinated. Of course, we needed structural engineers to go there and say, yes, this building is stable, this building is not stable, you know, and to make those rapid assessments. So engineers are critical in that first phase of response when lives are on the line. We also then see, okay, there's not necessarily an, an immediate emergency response required, but there's longer term development. And that's where organizations like Engineers Without Borders and the like start to step in. So this is where we, we look at longer term capacity development and capacity building. Uh, the classic uh, statement of we don't build bridges, we build people, that idea of capacity building. Um, and uh, looking at more of those, okay, well, people have the thing that they need right now, but now we need to look at how we improve that over time, access to those essential services. Um, and then also in Australia, we also consider uh, an additional space, uh, assistive technology or inclusive design. This idea that actually everyone should have access to the, those services that they need. Um, and a, a good example of this is actually the organization AbilityMade. So they are a for-purpose organization, not for profit. And they're also not a not-for-profit. They're allowed to make profit, but they're for-purpose. They are based in Sydney and they support um, kids who need custom-made orthotics and prosthetics. Um, and they um, use all their engineering skills to do that. Now, again, that's a service that is greatly needed, but there's no money to be made in that space or certainly not a lot of money but it's still in that space of, of working in the, these, these, uh, these areas. I should just uh, quickly note that the pictures here are just illustrative of these spaces. Um, so um, this then leads us into the education uh, space. And uh, I was personally inspired to gain more interest in, and move into the um, humanitarian field when I read uh, parts of the engineering uh, World Engineering Report by UNESCO. There was this statement in there in the opening blurb, really, which, which was stated, and it's different to the one on the screen, but I, I want to read it out. It says, in the, now and in the years to come, we need to ensure that motivated young women and men concerned about problems in the developing world continue to enter the field, engineering, in sufficient numbers. And it is that, that driver that, okay, well, we need to make sure that there's motivated people coming into this space. And we'll touch back on that a little bit later. 
but that's a really key framing of what we are trying to do in the education space. Don't forget that in Australia, as I believe in uh, the very majority of the world, uh, you need a, a tertiary education to really practice engineering. So therefore universities have a really major role to play in how we develop those, uh, those students. So this leads us on to the rise of humanitarian engineering in uh, Australia. And there's so many organizations, as we talked about there, working for poverty alleviation and social justice that were actually um, established by students or academics. So there's always been a connection between these uh, humanitarian engineering and humanitarian engineering education. In Australia, the growth of humanitarian engineering education really kicked off in uh, 2006 when the first programs started to emerge. Um, although the, the actual term humanitarian engineering only really became commonplace um, since we held the year of humanitarian engineering, which took place in, in 2011. And this was led by the peak body for engineering in Australia, Engineers Australia. I think that something that really helps with how we build a culture of humanitarian engineering practice is the fact that we have quite supportive workplaces and um, education spaces as well. Um, I have friends and family who are from the US and uh, I know that a lot of you are from the US today. And I think that it, so for some of you, it might be quite surprising the concept that um, an engineer working in, in it for an engineering company could take a year out of their job um, and go and do a year placement with a development organization overseas, um, working on humanitarian engineering projects, and then come back a year later and be welcomed back into the same role. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, my uh, US-based friends tell me, uh, yeah, they could come back, but they wouldn't have the job. You know, um, th there seems to be a slightly, uh, slightly tougher workplace environment there. Um, again, similarly, um, I know we've got uh, people on the call here who've even had uh, placements with Red R. The idea that you could be working at an engineering in an engineering office and at a moment's notice be called up on placement and be deployed overseas. Again, it's part of the culture, I think, of Australia where that's considered just part of yeah what you do, part of the engineering profession. And it's seen as strengthening your role in your main engineering uh, position. But coming back to... Uh, Australian education. Um, Australia is a big place um, and our universities are generally spread out. Um, our population is about 25 million and over 10 million of those people live in either Sydney or Melbourne, so just two cities. Um, it's sort of comparable in size roughly to the USA but with about 10% of the population. We only have 37 universities that offer engineering degrees. And most of these universities are centered around the major metropolitan, major metropolitan areas in larger cities, such as Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. Now we mentioned that we had someone who was based in Perth uh, on the call today. And just for context, if you're not quite, if you're not too familiar with Australia, then Perth is sort of roughly where San Diego is on the, this map of the US, but, but along on the coast. And there's another city um, called Adelaide, which is another state capital, which is sort of where Dallas is on, on the map there. And between those two cities in Australia, there's, there's pretty much nothing. Um, and so you have this huge rural urban split. In fact, there's one road that goes between those two places through this place called the Nullarbor. And last summer, there was a bushfire. It takes 28 hours, by the way, to drive that route on the, on the roads that we have. And last summer, there was a bushfire and it closed that road. There was a fire literally you know, passing over that road. Fire service closed it down. Well, just to um, put it into perspective, the diversion that was put into place uh, added an additional 49 hours to your drive, to your original 28 hour uh, drive, because the diversion took you all the way around the coast, up to Darwin, down through Alice, the very middle of Australia and down to, to Adelaide. So what I'm saying by that is, we're a big country, but we're also quite spread out. And this creates a real strong urban rural uh, divide. So a lot of universities are in the urban centers and a lot of students will live in urban centers. That also means that for a lot of students who already live there, they're actually attending university in their home city and quite frequently live at, continue to live at home with their, their family and their parents um, rather than moving into a different space. Um, I just think that's quite an interesting uh, cultural point that, um, that I wanted to share. Uh, conversely, I think that I could see that there are at least 
almost 400 colleges in the US that offer engineering schools, uh, engineering degrees, and I'm sure there are probably more. I know that there are, you know, thousands of universities in that space. But I just wanted to provide a little bit of context as to uh, the university space in here. So, um, Moving on to uh, humanitarian engineering programs, we can see that since 2006, as I mentioned before, when we started to get these programs into play, we can see that there's an increased engagement with different programs, and these are ramping up. What's really cool is these are national programs. I've just taken data from a paper that we did uh, with some colleagues a couple of years ago where we were looking at the, the the changes and the trends. You can see here that think programs like the EWB Challenge, which is a national first year engineering program, picked up a lot of initial um, uh, numbers and uh, initial drive and led a lot of the growth of humanitarian engineering. The cool thing about this is that for most university students, they will all get to do uh, the challenge, which we'll talk about later. And then you can start to see other programs creeping in. So towards 2014, the research programs really ramped up. So this is for final year students who want to focus their final year piece of research on a humanitarian topic. And now we're starting to see since 2015, the growth of, um, of these immersive courses where students actually spend few weeks overseas in an international context. Um, there's also a lot of universities which are now starting to introduce their own programs. So since 2015, we know of at least 10 universities which have launched humanitarian engineering courses or programs. So the University of Sydney sort of really led the way with um, its, uh, it has essentially, uh, a, 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 well, it calls itself a major, but in reality, it's uh, a set of four courses. Um, and uh, other universities like the University of Adelaide um, approved to commence degrees. Um, University of Canterbury in, the, in New Zealand has a, uh, a diploma in, in global humanitarian engineering. Um, University uh, of um, New South Wales has courses commencing uh, in humanitarian engineering and a humanitarian focus. So there's, there's more programs coming online where it's quite dedicated. Something which recently came up at a conference I attended was the fact that actually in Australia, one of the limitations of our engineering programs is how many core courses or how rigid the course structure is. In my understanding of the US system is that you can almost choose your own adventure as long as you do some core engineering elements. There's a lot more flexibility in some of the uh, some of the other courses that you can choose. In engineering, it's pretty much if you choose engineering, you're doing four years of solid engineering courses with maybe one or two free electives, but even then those, they try and get you to do something technical. There's a lot less space to start saying, right, actually, do you know what? I'm gonna take a social science course or I'm gonna take languages or I'm gonna take anthropology. So this means that we have to try and work within these frameworks to develop the, this space and, and see what we can do to bring in more ed education. So very quickly, um, I just want to run you through how we're conceptualizing, going back to that UNESCO uh, concept of we need more motivated young men and women joining the engineering profession concerned with issues in the developing world. So if we run through um, here, we can start to see that we're thinking about how students are motivated. Well, we see the next generation of students coming through who are very passionate about issues of climate change. This was the school strike uh, for climate action that took place in Melbourne last year. This is school students, thousands of school students leaving school saying we demand better, work, better action on climate. These, these students are coming through our doors next semester and it's exciting the fact that uh, there's clearly the motivation. However, motivation by itself is potentially not everything. I've conceptualized this little concept here of saying like, look, we need people who are motivated, but they also need to hold them the capability. There's an issue that potentially those people who are really motivated to make a difference, but actually don't have the ability to, can be quite dangerous. Um, I'd refer you actually to my colleague uh, and friend, uh, Chris Berza, who I think is on the call today. Uh, his recent paper, uh, Humanitarian Engineering Education Fieldwork and the Risk of Doing More Harm Than Good, is a nice place to start to understand this, this concept of, you know, actually you can do more harm than good if you don't have the capability. And there's plenty of examples of this. So moving forward, um, we can then see that we want to try and get people in this motivated, they're capable, but I would say that we need to add in this third element as well, which is 
diversity as well. We need diverse people, uh, people who come in with these different thoughts, who are able to, um, different ways of working to combine into this space. So this is framing, I guess, our overall thoughts for humanitarian engineering at Australia, in, at RMIT. How do we get people who are highly motivated, who are highly capable and come from diverse backgrounds? And this is what we see as the role of our university. How do we move people in these different directions and how are we attracting aligned students? Um, I have probably gone a little bit over time. So I am gonna quickly handball, as we say in Australia, onto Tanya to talk more about the actual initiatives that we're All good, Nick. Thank you for that. It was really interesting. So it was worth the extra little bit of time. So I'm going to pivot a bit. Nick has provided a really wonderful context about what humanitarian engineering is in Australia and the, and the broader context within which we work um, and, and how we see our role as teachers um, of humanitarian engineering students, this idea of, of move, increasing capability and increasing motivation as well. Now I'm going to talk about how we specifically do that through our courses. Um, so as was mentioned in the beginning, uh, Nick and I recently launched what we call the Humanitarian Engineering Lab. Um, at the moment, it's uh, it's more or less just a website, but essentially, um, it what is going to be transformed into, and it's slowly transforming into, is a network of students and academics who are passionate about humanitarian engineering. So we're trying to really galvanize, uh, bring together all the people at RMIT that are already there, who are already working in this space, and bringing them together under the umbrella of humanitarian engineering. So how that looks is that there is Nick and I, we have a couple of PhD students and a growing number of both capstone students and master students. And capstone students in Australia is essentially the final year uh, engineering students. So the, in Australia, that is four, fourth year engineering undergraduate students. Um, so we kind of form the lab. Um, and then we have a bunch of interested academics. are already working in humanitarian settings. Um, and then obviously a, uh, a range of industry partners uh, that provide um, projects, that provides case studies for the students and for our research as well. And together, all these people, uh, the Humanitarian Engineering Lab, we are trying to provide humanitarian edu education to both current students, past students, and also practitioners in the field. And um, building on what Nick says about the conceptualization of uh, humanitarian engineering education and RMIT, I'd say um, what we really start with is trying to dismantle this common notion of what an engineer is. If you Google the word engineer, you see um, a certain subset of the population, say a certain gender, a certain skin color, and uh, also a certain age represented by those pictures. And obviously everybody in hard hats, yellow hard hats. Personally, being an engineer, I've never worn a hard hat except for rock climbing. So I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what, what you as engineers are there, how often you wear hard hats, but we definitely feel that this doesn't really represent the broader engineering field in various ways. Um, so we really want to question this idea of what an engineer is, trying to make it something different. Um, so obviously, uh, like every good engineer, we do believe that engineering has to do with technology. It's about designing technology, improving technology. Um, and there is probably a, f a, a foundation of design. You need some design skills. You need to be able to lead a design process and you need to have the tools uh, to go uh, to go through that process as well, to develop these technologies. Um, but as I'm sure a lot of people on the call, at least I know a few people on the call that do agree with this, engineering also has a big social dimension. Engineering is really a social technical discipline. Uh, the social and the technical need to go hand in hand. Um, and as, as Nick was just mentioning, engineering students in Australia, or at least at RMIT, they cannot simply go and take a sociology class or an anthropology class. So for our humanitarian engineering uh, classes and courses, it's really important that we provide that social lens, that we teach them and demonstrate how they can um, better understand the, co um, the social context within which they are working. Um, but we also think that it's important that engineers understand the broader context within which they work, not just the social dimensions. Nick was just mentioning uh, in the beginning of, uh, of his talk the importance of, in Australia, of working on country, the concept of working on country, and how it's really important that when we as engineers go out and work, whether in Australia, overseas, in America, that we step very gently and that we consider 
what is already there, um, the long cultural traditions and histories uh, of that land um, and the people that occupy it. Um, and and take that into consideration. In terms of context, obviously, it could also be the political, the institutional, the governance context, the ethical context, and so on. Um, so we try and give our engineers this broader perception of what uh, engineering is. And we really reconceptualize really this as uh, we are trying to make engineers not specialists, but we are trying to turn them into GPs. Um, with the concept of GP, really what we mean is that when you go into a doctor's office and you meet with your GP, they're not a specialist in anything, but they kind of know a little bit about everything. So they can sort of, they can diagnose your problem and they can point you in the right direction. And that's what we are trying with our humanitarian engineering courses. We are trying to teach our students um, not so much the technical skills, but how to go into a context to diagnose an issue and then figure out which kind of specialties do we need to uh, involve so we can solve this, this, um, this problem. And this really features into the fact that we don't need a thousand humanitarian engineering uh, graduates in Australia. We just don't. There is just not a market for it. They would not have any jobs. But what we really need is uh, a lot of engineers who are really good at understanding the social dimensions, the broader context that they're working in, and can go out and diagnose problems, whether in Australia, whether overseas, whether in a uh, very developed context or in a lower developed context. So we're trying to teach them humanitarian engineering, not necessarily to work as humanitarian engineers, but to have the, those skills and expertise that humanitarian engineers working overseas need so they can apply it in their mining job or in their energy job back in Australia. So the way we do this, the way we transform our existing specialized engineering students into these more GP uh, engineers is that we kind of work with both humanitarian content in our courses and also with the humanitarian context. Um, kind of, I think a lot of people in, in Australia has this idea that humanitarian engineering is simply the application of engineering in a different context, in a low income, marginalized, vulnerable context. Um, but we believe that there is also a, a lot of specialized content uh, in this space, not just a different context. Um, so we have a range of courses over our program. So as I said before, the undergraduate program at RMIT is four years, and then afterwards you can do a post uh, postgrad. If you have done an undergrad at RMIT, you can just do one year of postgrad. If you come in from outside, well, you have to do two years to get your master's degree. Um, but from the very first year at RMIT, we expose our students, all engineering students at RMIT, to humanitarian engineering uh, contexts. So. At the very first year, we have a course called Introduction to Professional Engineering Practice, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, a bit later. Actually, I'll talk about all these courses a little bit later. Um, so at second and third year, uh, we kind of recommend that students that are interested in this space take an elective that's called Humanitarian Experiential Learning Project. They also have the opportunity to do a capstone project and for uh, master students doing, um, doing environmental engineering, sorry, they can take a dedicated elective in humanitarian engineering. And then we also, uh, for people that are doing a master's degree with us, uh, we recommend they do a thesis on humanitarian engineering. And as you can see, there is uh, introduction to professional engineering practice or IPEP is purely context. They don't get that much content about how to work as a humanitarian engineer, but they learn about the context. And for, for example, the human engineering master course it's more about content they don't actually get exposed that much to the context um, but the rest of the courses in between we uh, aim for them to both um, learn about the content and also not only um, learn about the context but also experience the context ideally traveling uh, to the context within which they are working and all these courses, uh, all these offerings together kind of creates a neat pathway. RMIT is not one of those universities in Australia that has a dedicated program. We do not have a minor or major in humanitarian engineering. RMIT doesn't have that concept of minors and majors, so we, we can't simply, um, but we still have a full pathway of uh, courses that can kind of uh, give you the humanitarian engineering specialization if you so wish. So on to the specific courses. So Introduction to Professional Engineering Practice is a common course for all first year engineering students that Nick coordinates. Um, and it has approximately 1000 engineering students entering this one course every single year. And they will all complete a humanitarian engineering project. Um, this project is 
proposed by Engineers Without Borders Australia. They have what they call the EWB Challenge, which is a national competition um, where they provide a website with a, a lot of material that really introduces the students to a context. Last year, it was an indigenous, um, the context of an indigenous communities in the far, far north part of uh, Australia in Cape York. And um, the website includes pictures, quotes, a lot of uh, explanations of life in this uh, community. It also includes like 3D walkthroughs of communities. So the student can really on a distance uh, get a insight into, into life in this community. So this is exposure to the context. Um, this challenge, uh, EWB has run it for the past decade. And um, really what we see it as at RMIT is a way of really motivating our students uh, to get interested in working in contexts uh, that are different from their own uh, contexts that are different culturally, contexts that are di different in terms of development level. Um, so Nick, uh, Nick Square before, really about increasing motivation of as many students as possible to explore this as a potential uh, career opportunity. Um, and the pictures you see here, the, the big picture with the orange carpet is actually from uh, the World Engineering Convention last year, where um, some of the students got the chance to present their solutions to um, the uh, convention delegates. So uh, it's quite a big deal here in Australia. Uh, I think, is it today or? Yet yesterday and today, Engineers Without Borders were running um, a big event where the students get to showcase their solutions online this year. The second to third year course we have, we call the Humanitarian Experiential Learning Project. And this is really um, one of our core humanitarian engineering courses at RMIT. It's a course dedicated to humanitarian engineering and um, it's an elective for all, that all engineering students can take. So far to date, we have had about 300 students take, take um, or go on uh, experiences as part of this course or just before that course was started. Um, and we have kind of, um, gotten in about one and a half million Australian dollars of mobility funding to support this course. So really the course provides uh, a set of workshops for the students, some workshops before a experience and some workshops after an experience. The pre-experience workshops really set the scene, introduce the students to humanitarian uh, engineering uh, content. So really teaches them uh, about interview techniques, about ethical practice, about cross-cultural contexts and how to navigate that. Then they go on an experience which um, pre-COVID has been overseas to countries like Nepal, India, Cambodia and Timor-Leste, uh, where they spend two weeks or three weeks four weeks sometimes overseas. Um, we as RMIT do not uh, do those or like organize those trips. Those are partner organizations that organize them. Partner organizations like Engineers Without Borders, uh, Unbound and Pollinate Energy. Um, so that give students a fantastic experience. The student then come back um, having had a brilliant couple of weeks and then we um, have them at RMIT where we have a couple of extra workshops to really support the students in reflecting on that experience and figuring out how can they use what they've learned overseas in an engineering context in Australia. Again, this idea of making them engineering GPs rather than humanitarian engineers. They might may never work in that context again, but the skills that they've learned overseas can be applied in a domestic context as well. Um, I have to mention that the students really love these experiences. This is a very popular course and always gets tremendous feedback, not surprisingly. Uh, obviously, with COVID, this has been a bit challenging. Students cannot travel overseas. We are very lucky in Australia. We hardly have any COVID cases anymore. Um, and life is more or less back to normal, um, which I'm sure not many other parts of the world can say at this, mo at this point. But we still can't travel overseas. Uh, obviously, the Australian borders are more or less shut. Uh, so this coming uh, semester, we will be doing a virtual experience. We will be still be running this course, but now with a virtual uh, experience in the middle, which will still be delivered by port partner organizations, specifically Unbound and Pollinate Energy. So we'll run the course in January and stay tuned. Feel free to contact us to hear how that goes. Um, we, we don't know yet, but it will be really interesting to see. So it will still be a two to four week experience that the partners are in control of, where they will teach them uh, how to work in a humanitarian setting um, and specifically get them to work on um, on specific projects so they will still be doing design projects but virtually um, so yeah a very different experience I'm sure for the undergraduate we also as I mentioned have capstone projects and this is really where we we don't even we don't just work on um, 
creating motivation or giving them the skills as the previous two courses, but here we really focus on impact. So we, we want the students to have impact here. They've already through the other two courses, they've been motivated to do it. They've gotten the skills to do it. Now it's time to, um, to have real world impact. So we have, uh, have a few dozen of uh, capstone projects, final year engineering projects each year, specializing or focused on humanitarian engineering. And this is a picture from actually one of Nick's groups last year, where they worked on a pickle bank, pickling bank. So a bank of pickles, essentially, in Timor-Leste. Uh, so there's um, issues with food preservation, and pickling is quite an amazing way of preserving food. So this pickling bank um, kind of teaches people and supports people in pickling and also storing uh, food. So uh, we can increase food preservation in this context. So just one example of real world impact that we are trying to have with these projects. Uh, another big um, project, ongoing program, I would even call it, that we have at RMIT is called Self-Sufficiency and Sustainability in Remote South Pacific Islands. Um, we have gotten a lot of funding from um, the Australian government to have an ongoing educational program that's now run for the past three years, where engineering students each year uh, visit um, the same community in, the, in Fiji, in a place called the Yasava Islands, and conduct projects. Um, so we're specifically working with two community, Moira and Kese, and we're trying to um, develop projects that are continuing year by year by year. So we, over the long term, have a uh, real practical impact for these community communities. So just as an example, um, one project that we've been working on for the past three years is improving uh, access to clean water within the community. So uh, the first year, uh, the students conducted, they surveyed drinking water sources and really tried to figure out what was the quality and quantity of water available. They both have water springs and rainwater tanks and um, groundwater. So really trying to understand the, the context of water. Also interviewing community members to try and figure out what are their priorities and interests, looking at different techno, uh, technical solutions, uh, water filters, um, solar still, whatnot. And uh, really this last year, a big focus um, for one group has been to develop a five-year action plan to really enhance the access to safe drinking water in this community. And as you can see on that bottom picture to the right, part of this has also been to train community members in actually conducting their own water quality testing. So um, when we like now happened with COVID, we actually couldn't travel there. We still have local capacity that we can work with um, to actually continue this project. So this semester, um, lo local um, uh, collaborators and the local partners actually conducted quite comprehensive research for us, um, tested the water quality of all the water sources and provided that data. Um, and we hope to continue similar work next year. Uh, as well. Another example from that same project is uh, colleagues uh, that have actually worked with um, communities again to monitor uh, microplastics. So they don't have necessarily much uh, plastic in the Yasava Island themselves, but uh, it comes through the ocean, so it lands on the beaches. So um, the um, these, this group have uh, worked with local partners to actually have them map. You can see in the bottom picture here how they're mapping all the uh, the small tiny bits of microplastic. Um, so yeah, in a virtual world, we are kind of continue these projects, and we think also actually working in um, in a better ethical way with international development. We're actually shifting our focus rather than us traveling there and conducting the research. We are now working with local partners and uh, building their capacity to. Um, to conduct their own research. We are slowly running out of time, so I'm gonna sk probably skip a little bit of this, but just to mention, we also have a dedicated humanitarian engineering master course. Um, so just in summary, the entire program um, sort of have, uh, yeah, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,100 first year students. It's really about increasing motivation. We have the humanitarian experiential learning project. It's really about increasing their capability. Next model before. And then when we get to capstone and um, final thesis, it's really about having impact, um, uh, creating change uh, out in the real world. Also, just to mention that uh, we recently uh, were lucky enough to get a couple of PhD students on board, and we actually got uh, more than 30 applications for two positions. So we definitely think that there is a growing interest in not only undergraduate and, um, and master level, um, introduction to humanitarian engineering, but also PhD level. Uh, so we're really excited to explore this further and hope to get more PhD students in the future. So just 
quickly our take on the future of humanitarian engineering in Australia. And there are other humanitarian engineering educators from Australia on the call I've seen. So maybe they can pitch in in the chat box if they d disagree with this, <laughs> uh, with, with what I'm saying now, just in case uh, we all have different perspectives. But what we really see is that um, if, uh, if we look at our, the cohort of students in Australia from the, the 17 to 18 year olds, it's about 50-50 men and women. Um, and we also see humanitarian engineering, interestingly, is about 50-50 men and women. Um, so there's a lot of uh, females that take humanitarian engineering courses, which we're really excited about and really happy about. However, it doesn't really correspond um, with, with the distribution of gender uh, within the engineering discipline overall. So if we look across the university, it's probably more female. If we look within engineering, it's typically more male students. Um, so when we, when we sort of take the females and put them into humanitarian engineering, some other disciplines might you know, have less, have less females there. So really in the future, what we really want humanitarian engineering to do is not kind of just take the motivated students and that be uh, a lot of female uh, students. We really want to shift, as I said, the notion of what engineering is. We want more people, more diverse cohort, not just gender, but also other types of diversity, bring them into engineering. So we really want to shift um, the notion of what engineering is. So maybe we can try and draw uh, some yeah, some uh, students from, from other engineering disciplines. Uh, so we hope that is going to happen. Um, also in Australia, we're very excited to see that um, humanitarian engineering is not, not just something happening uh, within in universities anymore. Uh, last year, the Aust Engineers Australia, like the peak body for engineers in Australia, launched the humanitarian engineering community of practice. So we're really seeing it not only becoming like an academic discipline, but also really becoming out uh, becoming a discipline out there in the practical world. As Nick mentioned, several consultancies are taking it on board as well. And uh, IEEE has recently, or is going to launch an interest group in human technology in Australia as well. Last but not least, uh, in Australia, we this year got what we call a field of research code in humanitarian engineering, which is massively important in Australia. This is how we track all our research. And without this specific dedicated code, humanitarian engineering engineering was engineering other, which basically means we don't know, really know what it is. So now it is a dedicated research discipline, which um, is going to change a lot for us. I'm going to finish there and just say thank you so much for having us and feel free to reach out if you're interested in, in what we're doing, if you're interested in collaborating. Uh, we didn't talk about our research, but um, happy to talk about that as well. Look us up on LinkedIn, wherever you can find us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tanya and, and Nick for, for sharing uh, all of all of these exciting program developments and, and your conceptualization of uh, humanitarian engineering with us in this seminar. I think it's massively useful and inspiring for those of us in the US are hoping to get to these you know, we're also working on building these types of programs and, uh, you know, it's really, really impressive to see what you guys have achieved. Um, we have some questions in the question and answer, so I'm going to try and synthesize some of those in the few minutes that we have left. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to get to, uh, maybe combine a couple of these questions together, um, could you talk a little bit more about the difference between what is humanitarian engineering content and what you might consider traditional engineering content, right? So you're saying we want to shift, or what I heard was that you want to shift sort of, okay, like let's shift what engineering means. Like we think that we'll, you know, we, what we are doing is engineering, but humanitarian engineering, we have different courses, we have the social component, we have these other things that you've discussed. Um, I, maybe you could elaborate a little bit, specifically maybe both in the type of project so is it a, you know, a relief, you know, emergency disaster situation versus a more long-term sustainable development? You mentioned these different areas. I imagine the content is probably different or the approach might be different for those situations. Um, but then also looking at, you know, across organizations, across sort of everyone who's working in this field of research code, what does that, what does that mean to you in terms of the content we're delivering to students like what's what's what separates it i guess so so a big question um maybe i'll i'll have a first punt at it and then tanya can uh, work out the bits that i missed uh so i i think that jesse the, the way that i think about this is i did an environmental engineering degree at university and i was interested in sustainability and you'd think that sustainability was a big part of environmental engineering but actually there we had a third year course called sustainability 
And whenever I talked about sustainability, someone would say, yeah, yeah, you, you do, you do sustainability in the third year course, you know, uh, don't, don't talk to me, you know, we're here to learn about fluid dynamics. Don't talk to me about sustainability. Whereas I now see in our own education at RMIT, how sustainability is now entrenched across pretty much all courses and across all programs, which is obviously a fantastic thing. So I think that humanitarian engineering could be a similar thing in the sense that we're saying, look, this is, this is its own set of some things or others. Um, it's about, um, for us, you know, it's about having those additional, those heightened skills, things like um, design skills, that, that concept around participatory design, co-design, the understanding that actually problem defining is as important or more important than problem solving. And I think that a lot of standard engineering disciplines focus on the problem solving stuff. Here's your problem, go away and solve it. Humanitarian engineering is half as much about, uh, you know, it, half of it is about problem problem um, defining and understanding and working with people understanding that actually you know people who you're working with often have the solution to the to the, to the problem that you're coming up with and as as Tanya would sort of mentioned in that element the way that we see that or conceptualize in a way is <clears throat> just saying there are these additional skills and competencies that we think that you that you should learn to be able to function well in the humanitarian context we think that all engineers should have those because not only do they help you in those work in those humanitarian contexts, but they also help you with your regu regular non-humanitarian engineering practice. Um, and so therefore it could be something a little bit like sustainability in that way where it's something that actually everyone needs to consider to a, to a certain degree. Of course, we have people who, who specialize in sustainability and that's their main driver. Um, but then it's also something that is uh, is is uh, fluid, like throughout the programs. I don't know if that maybe that's maybe that, Tanya. Can you help pick up those pieces that I've just thrown in the air? <laughs> no, I, th I think it was really good, Nick. I guess I will just um, bring bring my perspective. Um, so for me, it's really about the kind of mindset you bring to your engineering. Um, as Nick mentioned, as I also mentioned, we work in Australia, we work on Aboriginal land. We have to be mindful. We have to step gently. Any project an engineer does, we should step gently. We need to be very aware of the context we're working in, the social dimensions that we might be influencing. Uh, we need to navigate that very carefully. Um, Nick mentioned that uh, there, there had been some cultural sites in Australia that recently had been destroyed because of mining activity or building roads, for example. As engineers, we need to be mindful that we are, if we are going to do things like that, we need to consider it very ethically and we need to talk with the people who those cultural sites are important for before we start acting. Um, so I think that's really the sort of ethical dimension, the empathy, the need to engage with people, talk with people, rather than taking top-down technical engineering decisions that I at least think, and I think Nick would agree, and that that's really what we are trying to teach. Uh, that's great. So, um, and I'm just going to try and try and maybe maybe bring that back to 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 see if I'm understanding it correctly. So, I think I think what I'm hearing is that if you think about sustainability, right, and you're talking about this emphasis of sustainability, there's uh, economic impact, there's environmental impact, and there's sort of social impact, right? Those would be sort of the three main areas that I think in the US we would say sustainability, you would look at those three areas, right? Um, and I think uh, one of what I'm hearing is, is that as engineers, we need to be understanding and thinking about and having analysis of, uh, you know, techniques that take into account some of these other areas. And we didn't used to necessarily consider environmental impact. And now we maybe we have a broader uh, approach set of approaches to be able to do that and it's more embedded in our day-to-day -day engineering practice and I think it, what I'm hearing you suggest is that this social piece of it potential social impacts how the systems and artifacts that we're creating technologies we're developing are interacting within a social context is equal as equally as important and therefore should be considered in our engineering practice is that that sort of yeah, that, in, in the it's, line with what you're with what you're bringing. Yeah, up. that's definitely in line with what I'm saying. I think it's also um, for me, it's also about 
literally the mindset, the ethics that you bring into the project, the kind of engineer you want to be, the kind of impact you want to have. So one thing is measuring the social impact. But another thing is really feeling it. Um, so, you know, like, so so be, being mindful that, that you want to go out there and you want to have positive impact, whether that's uh, environmental or social, uh, cultural, whatever. But but you are mindful that that you are not the only one to consider that there is a, you are part of a bigger whole, you are part of a complex um like you're part of social relations as well um and and you are not the only one engineering everybody is engineering together yeah no if that's I... really great that's a really important uh i think we don't in engineering traditionally consider ourselves enough as part of the system right we're sort of interchangeable engineers we can just throw anybody in there and they can do the physics or whatever and have the same answer and i think you're suggesting no you're part of it and like, let's let's bring that mindset into it and realize that we are part of the system. Nick, you were going to say something. I apologize. Oh, no, no, no. All good. Uh, look, I, I was just going to potentially add on and then potentially answer some part of the other another question as well, which is sure. when we're talking about this GP concept, the idea here is that if we think that obviously we, we need people with deep specialist knowledge to be able to tackle some of these wicked problems. So we could either try and make sure that they get trained up or that we, as we say, we, these additional competencies to be able to work in humanitarian contexts well, so that they are successful. But you then got a deep specialist who then has that, that space. Then there's this, there's this other concept, which is, well, actually, maybe you have this, this GP person who has this much broader understanding and is able to work in that space, but doesn't have that technical knowledge. And so they needs to bring on that technical specialism as well. But you still need that person with that deep technical specialism to still have some of that that humanitarian context as well probably didn't actually probably made it more co confusing so uh no no, no. The, the... i think uh, what i'm hearing is is you're saying look we need to have people that are general that have a broad range of understandings um but also someone who's like doing fluid dynamics and is like really in deep in fluid dynamics also needs to understand the humanitarian engineering context enough that when the generalist person is saying hey i want to bring you in to solve this fluids problem that involves that's in this larger context, they know they have enough competency to be able to engage across that team and be able to you see do those things. this is this is the benefit of having had a couple of coffees, Jesse, you know, you're a bit later in the day and you, <laughs> your brain is fired up. Thank you. That's yeah. perfect. Thank yeah, you. No, that's great. So I just have one last question. And I actually have many questions, personal questions. Uh, I want to let the people know on the call uh right on the seminar right now the participants there's a lot of questions here this discussion obviously very engaging for everyone and we're getting a lot of questions we're obviously not going to have enough time to answer all of them so what we're going to do is we're going to give them to tanya and nick to answer in writing and when we post the recording of the seminar later the those answers uh will be there for you uh afterwards but i just want to ask uh you know do we have sort of a, a growing ecosystem of humanitarian engineering in australia and there are a bunch of questions related to, okay, what are the programs? You know, can we get some specifics on these things at the different places? Or does it exist in Western Australia? But I just wanna, I wanna, you know, maybe generalize this a bit more. What do you think is the next steps? What are, what are the next things to really take this? You know, you're talking about, okay, IEEE in Australia, Engineering Australia is having these communities of practice and practitioners. We're starting to see academic programs come together. How do we take this community if we really want to shift engineering, right, and build this sort of much bigger community where it becomes a norm to have this empathy, to have this mindset um, and practice these competencies? In your guys' view, what, what are some of the sort of maybe challenges or opportunities to take it to the next level, right? Like, so how do we go from, okay, we have some, a few programs and a few universities to this is a normal thing that is in every university or that everybody does well, everyone recognizes this is a, a mainstream thing, right? Discipline, if you will. Jesse, I think that this really talks to some of the work that me and Tanya are doing, along with a number of other people in the, um, in the chat actually who have joined us, who are part of this uh, community of practice, the humanitarian engineering community of practice, because it was kind of okay whilst there, it was quite ground up. I would say the humanitarian engineering movement to date has been very ground up. You know, the academic who's really keen on this thing has started to now work in this space. Me and Tanya are some of the very first academics 
in Australia who have the name humanitarian engineering in our job titles. So a lot of our predecessors, including some of the people on the call, are, you know, professor in mechanical engineering, but they love humanitarian engineering, but their, their job title is, is, is mechanical engineering. So it's, all, it's been very much personal interest and making small changes here or there. We're starting to see a point where we're getting this mass movement across Australia, where a, lo a num number of programs are starting to spring up. Now, we talked about this before, about this idea of having motivation without capability. And it, ironically, we're actually starting to see this a little bit in the educators themselves. And there's a few programs coming out, which I won't personally name, but which I read some of the things that they're doing. And I'm like, oh, God, like this is, you know, I'm not sure this is the this is the right. This certainly wouldn't be the let's just put it this way. It's not the approach that I would take if I was delivering the, the same course content. Um, and so it does now mean that there is a bit more of an onus and a bit more of a uh, drive for doing something at that national level and getting a more nationalized framework together. And actually, the community of practice is taking a really strong lead on this and, and, and trying to step up uh, around a concept that we're calling professionalizing humanitarian engineering. We think that there are six areas that we really need to work on as the next steps. The first is actually working on a definition. Is that, do we need, first off, do we need a definition? Do we, or do we need a fixed definition? We know that Red R, EWB, other organizations have their own definition of humanitarian engineering, and that's fine. Maybe it's okay that a lot of organizations have their own definition, but maybe we need just some kind of umbrella, something to just space, space there. The other thing is, do we need national frameworks? How do we actually define humanitarian engineering amongst the national frameworks? Is it an area of practice? Is it a discipline? What, you know, what does it actually look like when we're trying to talk about it with other people who are, you know, we can't just say, oh, it's this. We actually need to sort of be able to have the language which exists within our initial frameworks, which for us is in Engineers Australia. The other thing we need to look at is the competencies. So we've talked about these things, these additional competency elements. All right, we need to actually get them nailed down. How, how are they demonstrated? So don't forget that as educators, we don't need to just have students work on competencies. We need them to be able to demonstrate them, evaluate them, and so on. Um, and we also need to be able to work on those best practices for how we teach those competencies. What is the best practice for doing this? Um, let's make sure that we're not uh, actually setting students up in a, in a quite a negative way. Um, we also need to support our um, our profession and we need to support those engineers who aren't just coming to university, but actually have maybe got years of experience as humanitarian engineers working in the field. We're starting to see more people, engineers, who've got this, this real world humanitarian experience looking for a chartership, um, you know, that professional standing as a, what we call stage two engineer, a chartered engineer. And they're bringing their humanitarian experiences in. But ironically, it's the assessors of those chartership applications that have no idea what it means to be a humanitarian engineer. So they're struggling to understand how this person's experience can actually relate back to the framework. And we think that we have a role there to help those more experienced people as well. And, and again, as more universities are starting to de deliver projects, they're gonna need to be accredited. So, um, so we, again, we need to make sure that they're meeting this standard of engineering education. So those are the big six areas that we're working to professionalize humanitarian engineering across Australia. Wow. Uh, that was the best answer that I could ever expect. So it's amazing. Well done. Um, I, I was taking uh, notes on that. So I'm going to have a meeting with you later. Uh, I'll send you an email. We'll discuss that because we're working on very similar things here with ASME and, and how do we develop those types of standards uh, and processes, both for education and for, uh, for practice, right? Um, so with that, I think, unfortunately, we are well over time. I want to thank both Sorry. you, Nick and Tanya. No, it's not. I'm asking a lot of questions and I wanted to hear the answers. So this is on me. Um, I want to thank uh, both of you for, for sharing with us your expertise and insights and your experiences. Um, I think it was wonderful. I'm certainly inspired and, and walk away from this uh, every month, but especially this month thinking, okay, how do, how do we take it to the next level here? You know, Australia is showing us what we need to do. We need to step up our game. Um, and, uh, and to the questions that didn't, we didn't get to, I apologize, but we will be answering those in written form, hopefully, and you'll see those posted along with the recording of this seminar. Mar Mariella, do you wanna just take a minute to uh, wrap it up? Uh, and I, again, yeah. Nick and Tanya, thank you very much for your time and everyone else for staying uh, at this unusual time. We will see you in, in January. Mariella, could you please? Uh, take us out.
Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Nick and Tanya. It was incredible. I'm also a fan of what Australia has been doing in humanitarian engineering. So it's uh, a pleasure to have you with us and you know, so that you guys can share what you are doing in Australia for the rest of the world and for us here in the US. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for moderating it. I want to emphasize what Jesse is saying. We'll be answering the questions that we have many in the chat, very interesting ones, and we'll be doing that in a written form. Our next webinar um, for this, this seminar series that will start in January for 2021 it's not uh, will be. Good. I'll tell you now. <laughs> I was I was oh, gonna oh, say oh, it was gonna be as good. <laughs> um, and this will be uh, done by Jesse on January 13. So I would really invite you all to join us uh, for that first webinar of the year. Um, so yeah, I really encourage you to, to take a look at that, sign up if you haven't at Engineer for Change so that you receive that notification when we open up the registrations. Uh, I just wanna uh, be sure to announce this deadline um, from UC Berkeley Master of Development Engineering. Um, they're very close partners with us and I, we just wanna emphasize you know, this opportunity for the people that are connecting. This is um, the Master of Development Engineering in UC Berkeley, which is the first professional a opportunity to solving complex global challenges across the corporate, nonprofit, and government sectors from UC Berkeley. So this is UC Berkeley's take on this, and we really encourage you to learn more. This is in our opportunities portal, also on engineeringforchange.org. Um, and just to thank you for attending uh, and for staying a little longer. If you have any uh, questions, suggestions, uh, please email us. Be sure to become a member and have a great day for the ones uh, listening in Australia, for Nick and Tanya, a, a grand, great end of day for us here um, on this time zone. So thank you everyone for joining us and until the next time. Thanks everyone. We'll see you in January. <laughs>